Good evening and welcome. I am Lauren Gates, your host of this evening's Airway Health Solutions Conversation with Dr. Dania Tamimi, and we're understanding the airway through CBCT imaging. Welcome, Dr. Tamimi. I am so excited to have you on our series. I've had so many people reach out to me telling me how amazing you are and how you kind of bring radiology to life <laughs> in a simple and fascinating way. So welcome, and thank you for taking the time to share with us your experience. My thank you so much for inviting me. You know, I, it's, it's my honor. It's my pleasure. I'm so glad. And actually, D, uh, Dr. Steve Carstensen recommended he raved about you as well, saying I have to get you on as a guest because of all your knowledge that you have. And and I'm just going to actually read a testimonial, if I may, from uh, Dr. Michael Knight. If taking one of your courses, he shares that he sat in on a four-day CBCT airway course uh, last spring with Dr. Tamimi. And mind you, anything regarding radiology is typically a guaranteed sleeping pill for me. Dr. Tamimi is not only brilliant, but she takes the subject matter and has a way of bringing it to life like very few other lecturers are capable of doing. She is like a Dr. Moralia, only her lane is radiology, CBCT, and airway. So thank you again for uh, simplifying something that probably seems tremendously complicated and making it um, applicable to all the airway dentists and healthcare professionals out there. I'm gonna go ahead and take the time to give you a formal introduction because you have so many accolades. I'd want our audience um, to, to learn more about you. And then I just, I'll have you share just a little bit personal story of your journey and how you got where you are. So here's uh, Dr. D uh, Dania Tamimi graduated with the dental degree from King Saud University in Saudi Arabia. She trained at Harvard School of Dental Medicine and earned a doctorate of medical science and certificate of fellowship in oral and maxillofacial radiology in 2005. She is board certified by the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology. She is, is a reviewer and editorial board member for oral surgery, oral pathology, oral medicine, and oral radiology, as well as a reviewer for DMFR, oral radiology, head and neck, angle orthodontist, and AJODO. She is the lead author on two textbooks, Specialty Imaging Dental Implants and Specialty Imaging Temporal Mandibular Joint and a co-lead author on Diagnostic Imaging Oral and Maxillofacial, excuse me, Maxillofacial, yes, she lectures nationally and internationally. She currently runs her oral and maxillofacial um, radiology private practice in Orlando, Florida. What, what I find most fascinating about you is how you manage to make radiology exciting. You bring it to life, especially as it relates to airway health. So tell us a little bit about your journey to combine dentistry, radiology, and airway health with whole body health. Okay, so let, let's start from the beginning. I'm not okay. going to take up too much time because I know you want me to talk more radiology stuff, but to, to put it very basic here, you know, in addition to being a radiologist and a dentist, you know, I had a parallel career in, as a fitness instructor. So, um, you know, I taught Pilates and yoga and, and actually COVID time allowed me to delve even deeper into yoga therapy. Uh, so yoga for healthcare and with it comes an appreciation of basically the biomechanics of the body and how uh, it all interacts with one another. And uh, yeah, so, but prior to this yoga therapy thing, you know, I had that background, you know, I, you know, the human movement, the human biomechanics and physical fitness, and then of course, dentistry. And I had to make a choice at some point because I was popping out babies and it was hard for me <laughs> to, you know, to, to, to do them all, to do everything, you know? Right. So I stuck with the radiology because that's the moneymaker, right? Like the, the dentistry, you know, that's where you invest most of your dineros and all that. And then, um, but I, I still did the yoga on the side, you know? And then it wasn't until I met uh, David Hatcher up in Sacramento, who is an oral maxillofacial radiologist, a, a brilliant oral maxillofacial radiologist, who basically taught me everything I know about the TMJ. Mm -hmm. And little by little, we explored this whole airway thing and others, uh, other factions. And I have a, like, I am fascinated by anatomy. I just love anatomy. Um, I do cadaver courses. I mean, before COVID time, I, I was doing a cadaver course every other year, if not every year, you know? And um, yeah, so because my, my job, my radiology job is basically it, that's it, you know, to, to interpret anatomy to, to, to look mm -hmm. at anatomy do a dissection with my eyes every single time so combining that and just understanding 
uh, that back background understanding of how the body works, um, I guess that opened up my eyes and my mind to the connection of it all. You know, I never thought I could bring those two worlds together, but here we are, you know? Wow. Well, yeah. I'm excited for you to walk us through a scan so you can bring those worlds together for us. And, and there's a lot we can learn just by walking through a scan with you. So why don't we go ahead and, and, and get to it. If you can yeah. share your screen, that would be. Sure. Hold on just a second. Let me yeah, uh, do time. that. So before, before I do that, let me just give a little introduction here. So of course. I figured rather than to show slides and flip through slides, I would show you what I do. I'd show you what a radiologist would do in order to evaluate a patient with a co the complaint of sleep disordered breathing. Okay, now mind you, I don't usually get, get history, um, meaning that I, I work from home. This is my office right here. My husband usually walks, works right over there in that little nook right there. Wow. And uh, so we, you know, I don't see patients. The patients that come to me are basically virtually and, you know, through the internet and they're, you know, they, they come on my computer screen, I look at the scan and whatever information you give me is what I'm working with. And many dentists, unfortunately, don't give the radiologist enough information. So if I'm ever I'm going to say anything, if I'm going to ask anything of this group or, or all of dentistry, is please disclose more information about your patients to the radiologist, because, oh, that's you know, we will, um, you know, we will correlate that information to the patient's anatomy and help you figure out what's wrong with them. Uh, and unfortunately, many dentists like to play stump the radiologist, you know, let's just trigger, try to like, <laughs> like the radiologist figure it out by themselves, you know, and I don't want to bias the radiologist, but you know, that's not, that's, that's not conducive to, to helping anyone out, you know? So, okay. So what we'll start with, uh, I'm going to show you a case. I don't have history for it other than the patient has sleep disordered breathing, evaluate the airway. Okay. And, um, I want to talk about my, my methodology. All right. So when you go through a scan, you're going through anatomy. Okay. So you're doing a dissection with your eyes every single time. And, and there are two parts of your brain that are turned on. There's the radiologist brain where you're going through the anatomy, making sure there's no pathology. And then there's the dentist brain. So I'm a dentist, just like you. I, I graduated from dental school. I did all these dental procedures when I was in dental school. No more. Thank God. <laughs> But um, yeah, so I have uh, in my mind, I know what these procedures are and I will do the dentistry in my head, you know? So if I see something, I'm thinking, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'm thinking what that person's gonna be, um, you know, what that dentist is gonna be doing to this patient and try to help, see, help them and figure out if there's anything in the anatomy that might help, you know, treat the patient even better, you know, or, or impede that treatment. So, um, so yeah, so the methodology is go through the scan to make sure there's no pathology and then go through the scan to look at the indication for the scan and the dental stuff that needs to be done. Okay, so two parts of the brain, dent uh, radiologist and then dentist, okay? Just for the purposes of the time here, where I'm not gonna do the entire going through the scan like a radiologist because that's gonna take a lot of time. There's a lot of information on these Columbia CT scans skull base information and, and as well as cervical spine, uh, upper respiratory tract, you know, there's just a lot of information and, and it wouldn't serve you much to, for me to rattle out, you know, all these anatomical things. So what I'd really like to do right now is to show you um, how I ask the patient to divulge their history when I don't have their history. Uh, I'm asking them to tell me their story by looking at their bones because their bones are going to tell the stories. Okay. Um, just like, you know, has anyone here watched Bones? You know, I haven't, TV, but I TV don't know series. If, yeah. Okay. I'm sure that the yeah, so participants, somebody has. <laughs> yeah. So it's a crime drama, you know, and, and, and uh, David Borneas, you know, was on it, you know, the guy who was um, Angel, you know, the vampire. Yes. Back yep. when we were kids. Yeah. Okay. That I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. So anyway, so, yeah, <laughs> me too. So, <laughs> so he, you know, his, he's the FBI agent and she, the person called bones is actually, she's a forensic anthropologist. And basically she will go through um, like when they find the remains of, of an individual, she'll look at the bones and try to figure out not only how this person died, but 
you know, who this person was mm. through the function, how function remodeled their bones or the chemical compositions, what they ate, you know, that kind of thing through how the, the bones formed. So it's, it's a very interesting show. I mean, if you, if you have some time, I don't know if it's on Netflix or not, but you know, you can right. look it up. It sounds interesting. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, I, I, but when they right come up to your the alley, dentist, for sure. absolutely. I, just, <laughs> right. I, I eat that up. But we know what you just have to go la 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 when they talk about tea because right. you know a medical person wrote the script and you know they don't know tea. Okay. Okay. So anyway, okay. All right, so I'm going to make a, a, a statement right now, and some people might not agree with me, but I'm going to just make it because this is what I believe. What you think an airway analysis is is probably not what I think an air airway analysis is, okay? So when you're thinking airway analysis, the thing that might come to mind right now is those lovely volumetric measurements, you know, with all those colors and all of the oropharynx. And that's not really what the cone beam CT is for. Yes, you can get, you can have that, you know, you can, you can do that, you can create that measurement and create like a teaching tool or something like that, but that's not where the power of cone beam CT is. The power of mm -hmm. cone beam CT is the anatomic evaluation of the entire craniofacial complex for the risk factors for sleep disordered breathing, okay? And I'm talking about everything from the tip of the nose down to the hyoid bone, if I'm talking about respiratory tract, okay? But I'm also talking about the growth and development of the face, the TMJs, and also the cervical spine, okay? And if we're just gonna look at these numbers, these lovely colorful numbers, we're really not getting the full picture because these lovely colorful numbers are a, of a malleable tube. Okay, so why don't we just do something before I turn this? Sure, you know, absolutely, thing. Okay, this so, is very helpful. This is so, probably so, like about 30 questions that were asked. So right, so, so, so just, yes. just, just sit up tall, everybody. Sit up tall, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. place your feet on the ground and, you know, in neutral spine kind of thing. and. And just breathe in and out through your nose, okay? So breathe in and out through your nose and just notice what your breath feels like, okay? And now move your head forward, so like that. Move your head forward and breathe in and out through your nose. Just notice how your breath feels and then move your head back without tilting your head up. So you're just going like that, okay? Very and feel, <laughs> so yeah, double chins and all that. So mm -hmm. anyway, so how did that feel? I mean, how did you feel when you brought your head back like that? You know, like you there just was wanted to like this. <laughs> exactly. All right. Mm -hmm. So there was area restriction when you're back here, you know, and then when you move your head forward, you're opening up your airway. Okay. So when you are in a cone beam CT unit, all right, most of the time they're going to fix you somehow, um, meaning that they're going to keep you from moving by putting you in some kind of fixation device. All right. So the fixation device may be a chin cup. And that chin cup mm -hmm. is going to bring you forward. Okay. That fixation device may be a, a forehead strap, and that's going to move your head back. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything that's going to stabilize the head is probably going to take you out of natural head posture. So, whatever head posture you're looking at on the scan, unless you were very careful about putting that person in natural head posture, they're probably not going to be in natural head posture. And thus, the airway dimensions will not be reflective of what that patient looks like while they're awake. Now that's another point right there, okay? When you have sleep disordered breathing, you know, an episode occurring, a sleep apnea, are you awake or are you asleep? Or asleep, right? <laughs> and, and then you're probably lying on your back too, right? Because that's the way gravity goes back, all right? So, and when, you, when you're in a cone beam CT unit, most of these cone beam CT units are upright and you're awake, all right? So you've got gravity, first of all, changing the dimensions of the airway. And number two, your muscle tone, okay? So you're, you have this protective mechanism to keep your airway patent, okay? The muscles of the oropharynx, you know, the muscles of the tongue, of course, or the mouth, all that is working together to keep that oropharynx patent, all right? Can I just interrupt because this is a good timing. How can they get a neutral position in the CT? Is it possible? Okay, let me just finish this one point sure. and then, okay. So that, what I was saying is the, the, the natural head, you know, the head posture, the, the tongue, the mu sorry, the muscle tone, okay? And the other protective mechanisms that you have are to move your head forward and to move your mandible forward. 
Okay, those are things that are going to bring your tongue forward and move your head forward, open up your airway. Okay, so so when you're awake, you you use these things. When you're asleep, you don't usually use these things. Okay, so you're saying now, what what did you just say? I'm sorry, say that. I'm sorry. The question is, is there a way to get a neutral posture in a CT? There is, there is, but you know, you have to have that special made for you, uh, and the chiropractors, chiropractors now use cone beam CT and they have like these positioning devices, which are more like, you know, just like these pads that go on your head. So rather than you moving your head to, to, to fit into the machine, the machine just comes to you. Okay. And it's, it's really been eye opening working with chiropractors to see just how much, how much variation there is in how we hold our heads that, you know, according to why we, use our, how we use our bodies and how we've always used our heads, you know, because like wherever, whatever position you put yourself in over a long time, that's how your body is going to set, you know? Uh, yeah. Did I answer your question or did I yes, just you did. You said okay. it. Nope, you did. All right. Good. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So, all right. So with that said, um, I, I made that disclaimer. If you're here for, for volume measurements, I'll give them to you, but really they have no weight without clinical correlation because, and in fact, anything that you see on cone beam CT has no weight without clinical correlation, because guess what? We're not treating radiographs, we're treating people, okay? And, and people, you know, uh, if they're not symptomatic, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. You know, that's like a basic, first do no harm, right? Okay, so. Um, I'm so excited to see this part because, um, Seeing, I love seeing and, and telling. So. Okie dokie. So hold on, let me just take a sip of tea. Of course. All right, I'll lubricate my oral pharynx. <laughs> and I shall slip on my, my glasses so that I can see what I'm doing. Damn it, when you turn 40, things change. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, so let me scare my, uh, scare, yes, scare my <laughs> sheep. <laughs> Away. Okay, disclaimer, everybody, you know, this right. is about the time I start winding down, you know, right. I'm getting into bed and starting to drift off. Okay, so, and you really know, appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so things that come out of my mouth, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try <laughs> to be as, as clear as possible. You'll okay, just great. Yeah. All right. So, you know, I, I don't think I don't know if ever, everybody here is comfortable or knows how to look to read a uh, cone beam CT or knows how to go through scan and what, but I'll just like talk about basics here. Okay. So remember what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask the patients to tell me their story. Okay. And specifically their airway story, but also look for other clues that might tell me something about this patient. Okay. But first, before I do that, I need to orient my scan properly. Well, okay. And in order to orient my scan properly, I need to find some anatomy. Now, do you notice how like the anatomy here is not symmetric? Mm -hmm. Like here's the condyle here and here it's not mm -hmm. like, okay. So that's because the, the, the head's tilted on the scan. Look at how it's like kind of tilted. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So before we do anything, we need to reorient our scans. Okay. And what I use is the external auditory canals, which are these dark, these black lines right here. Okay. So that's your eardrum is basically right here. Okay. And that's the opening the external auditory meatus. So what I'll do is I'll try to bring them both on the same plane. And uh, as you can see here, they're not at the same plane. So what I'll do is I'll rotate the scan. Okay. Oh, and before I actually do this, let me, because once again, we, we might not all be on the same page. So these are three views. Okay. When you display your cone beam CT volume on your viewer, this is the first thing that's going to show up. Okay. And that is the axial view, the coronal view, and then the sagittal view. So what's the axial view? Imagine that you're a loaf of bread. Okay. And I'm slicing you to make toast. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or sandwiches or something. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the axial view. All right. And then the coronal view is like this. It's along the coronal suture. Just imagine you're, you're sitting underneath a guillotine, you know, things mm -hmm. chop, chop, block. Okay. <laughs> It's chopping this way, all right? All right, and then the last thing is the sagittal plane and that's along the sagittal suture. And that's like basically if I were to take a machete and just like slice you in half and then slice you with a super 
super duper very thin <laughs> slices you know that's that's your sagittal um plane okay all right so i'm trying to orient my scan so that when i'm looking at the anatomy it's appearing symmetrically on both sides okay and what i'm looking at here is my external auditory canals and i'm looking at the bottom of the external auditory canals as they appear on the coronal view okay so i will take this line right here and make it touch the bottom of that bone okay the bottom of the canal and as you can see here it's that's not touching it so i'm just going to rotate it a bit reorient it so that they're pretty much at the same level okay now i'll do the same thing here uh, where i'll take the back of the external auditory canal here and here and i'll also orient that and it's going to take a couple of passes just to get it perfect but this is like to me the most important part of the whole thing because like that's going to help you when you're scrolling through to look at the anatomy as it appears symmetrically and help you figure out if you're if you've got a pathology going on okay now remember we're not doing the anatomy part because that's going to take a long time okay mm -hmm. but this is also important for my other analysis which is to look for the stories in the bone okay so um, so yeah, so or I've oriented my axial, I've oriented my coronal, and now what I'll do is I'm going to orient my uh, sagittal. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the axial plane and basically make my anterior nasal spine, which is this right here, and the posterior nasal spine in line with that axial plane. So I'll rotate my scan slightly and then bring that line down there just to see where I am. Yeah, so uh, it's good enough. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's good enough, all right? The more important thing is, is these two, right? Because that's where you've got anatomy that you're scrolling through symmetrically and you need to see the foramen on one side and on the other, the sinuses on one side and the other uh, appearing at the same time as you're going through, okay? So that's it. So that's the orientation. I'm gonna get rid of all these, sorry, I'm gonna get rid of all these lines. All right, so now let me see what, what the story is, okay? There's the whole analysis, which I'm not going through, which is to see if there's pathology. We're not doing that right now, okay? What I'll do right now is I'll take, I'll create a panel because I'm a dentist and I like my panels just like any other dentist. Uh, it's just like a very comfortable place to be. Um, and I will create panoramic image um, that follows the, line of the arch as you can see and these lines right here these dots i just orient that to the arch of the mandible and then i can increase my focal trough a bit to include all these teeth okay. so after i'm done with that what i'll do is i'll create my panel all right and it gives me a general idea of what's going on with the patient's facial skeleton, you know, just like I, I would see on my panel. So I take a look at teeth in, in general, you know, I look to see if there's any pathology in the bone, um, you know, the sinuses and all that, that I would have already figured that out from looking at the pathology, the anatomy part in the beginning. Okay. But the thing that really um, is special here is that it's a panel with the teeth and maximum intercuspation, because like when you, um, when you acquire a 2D panel, a conventional panel, your teeth aren't in maximum intercuspation because you've got to bring the teeth onto this bite stick, bring the mandible into protrusion so that the, both jaws are in the focal trough, right? Okay, so here is the patient in maximum intercuspation. And now I can look at this in relation to the condyles, the TMJs, and where the condyles are in relation to the fossa. Okay, the thing that I notice here is that there's all this extra space on top of the condyle, right? So the condyles don't look like they're seated fully in the fossa. Okay, so let's create a TMJ cross-section view and further evaluate that. Okay, so I click this TMJ view right here and I will um, do something here just to decrease the contrast and the brightness just so that it's a little clearer. And then I'm going to come down to the level of the condyles and I will create cross sections um, along the long axis of the condyle and perpendicular to it, as you can see here. Okay, so this is how you cut the condyles. It, it should be following the anatomy of the condyles and not just in the true sagittal and true coronal. It has to be at a slant like this so that you're not only looking 
at the morphology of the condyles, but also at the spatial relationships between the osseous components. So we're not, um, you know, we can't see the disc on cone beam CT, but we can see the relationship between the bones, okay? And I know I didn't talk about like what the disc normally looks like or, and how the, the condyle fits in the fossa when, when everything is, is good. So I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things here, okay? So we will, let me get rid of these lines, okay? So the disc kind of looks like a bow tie, all right, in this, in this view. And the, the thickest part of the disc sits here, the thinnest part of the disc sits here, and then there's another uh, thick part right here. So the posterior band, the in intermediate zone, and then the anterior band. I, I can't see the disc, but I'm just like pointing out where it would be, all right? And the condyle should be a little bit more superiorly positioned, okay, uh, in this fossa. This condyle is out of the fossa. All right. Uh, another thing is in this coronal view, this condyle should be centered in the fossa and the space here should be even to, like as, if you were to draw a crescent moon with your eyes, should be able to have a nice little crescent moon that tapers down to the, to the uh, poles. As you can see here, the condyle is veered towards the lateral rim. This is the lateral rim right here, okay? And this is the kind of thing that happens when you open slightly. All right, when you open slightly, there's a little bit of movement. You know, as the condyle moves forward, it does veer a little bit laterally, okay? So these condyles are not seated in the fossa. They're anteriorly and inferiorly positioned in the fossa, all right? So that's a clue right there. With the teeth in maximum intercuspation, the condyles aren't seated in the fossa. All right, so let's put that in our back pocket and move on to the next thing. So we'll, we're gonna do a volume rendering, okay? And in the volume rendering, now I'm looking at the facial skeleton. I'm looking at just how this patient's face appears. And I can see that this narrowness and the transverse dimension of the arches. Okay, now I can measure this later, but this looks narrow, okay? It looks like the patient is narrow in this, in this part, in the inferior third of the face, okay? Even part of the middle third of the face. Okay, so there are some stories to be told here. Uh, let's look at it from the side. And what I'll do is I'm just gonna superimpose the two sides of the zygoma on top of each other, uh, right about there, okay. And in this side view, I'm looking for small jaws, you know, and it is a little bit of a small jaw, right? The mandible is a little small, um, but I do see this thing right here. This little bony protrusion and this bony protrusion uh, if I wanted to look at it with a little bit more finesse I can go to this right here and I'll see that there's a little bony exostosis here and also on the legal aspect and if I were to actually scroll through the entire arch I'm going to see these we'll look at these in, in just a little bit okay uh, actually you know what since we're here we might as well just look at them so we'll come to this uh, coronal and as I scroll through, I'm coming to the area of the teeth. These are the rami of the mandible. And as I come over here to the, the area of the teeth, I'm going to observe the fact that we do have these bony exostoses. Okay, bony exostoses. There's a little uh, palatine torus right here, mandibular tori. All right. So these, you know, there, there is a genetic component to tori. But when it's combined with these exostoses, also you, you try, kind of think to yourself, is there parafunction going on here? Is the bone telling you the story that there is something going on, there's excessive loading, and this is its response to that excessive loading? Okay. Even in the area of the suture right here, I mean, your bone is fluid, all right? It's not liquid, but it's fluid. If you ever held a dry ethmoid or a dry maxilla in your hands, you'd be surprised just how light it is. Uh, as compared to like when if it were alive and there was a lot of fluid in it and a lot of a bone marrow and uh, fat and all that, there's a big component of it that is, you know, that is fluid, that is in, in flux and that responds to biomechanical stimulation, right? So if you're constantly bruxing, parafunction, whatever, in whatever direction that you're doing it, then your bones are going to respond. And you, they can respond in the area where bones come together, which in the case of the maxilla right here is in the mid-palatine suture, okay? 
All right, so that right there, okay. All right, so uh, I did mention that the net transverse dimension of the maxilla is narrow. Um, I, I do this measurement for many dentists. They ask me to do it from the cemento enamel junction to the cemento enamel junction of the first molar. Uh, in my opinion, but I'm not a clinician. I know everybody has their own philosophies. The better measurement would be from bone to bone because sometimes you have lateral flaring of those teeth. So that's not really representative of how much space you have in the box, okay, uh, for the tongue. But this is what I'm asked to do. So I do that, you know, um, and this is obviously narrow, right? Okay, so if you're gonna go by McNamara's numbers, 36 millimeters is the cutoff, you know, but you know, I've heard some people in some airway circles say 39 is really the cutoff. So it depends on your philosophy, what you, you know, who taught you and what you believe. I'm looking at features. I'm looking at morphology. I'm looking at how this bone has responded to function, parafunction, sleep disordered breathing, which will, mm -hmm. uh, will be coming up soon, okay? All right, so there's that. And then um, I'll come back to the, the rest of the nasal cavity and all that, the upper respiratory tract. But first, uh, let's do what everybody, the moment that everybody's waiting for, which is the airway dimensions. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna get rid of all these lines, okay? So, okay. Mm -hmm. all right, so he, here's the thing, all right? you're trying to measure the oropharynx. The oropharynx starts at the fixed margin of the epiglottis. This is the tip of the epiglottis right here. And the fixed margin of the epiglottis would be somewhere down here, but because it's not on the scan, you can't include it, all right? So you're gonna have to start a little bit higher up. And the problem with the, the algorithm here, at least in this software, is if you start from here, it's gonna spill into, it's gonna just have a hard time creating the, um, the image, the volume. Okay, so let me show you by that. All right, so if I were to start from here and then take it all the way to the top of the oropharynx, which stops at the hard palate right here, okay, you see it's going to tell me some sections have overflow. You see it's like spilling into this area, which isn't airway, and it's not going to measure anything for me. Okay. All right, so yes, I want to delete airway. And if I want to do it right uh, for this particular patient, I'm just probably going to start a little bit higher up. So maybe around here and then come over here. So that way, you know, it's not spilling into that dark space, you know, and then go double click. And that gives me the volume measurement. All right. And as you can see, he has a small airway. Okay. But I wanna show you something. And, and once again, why I think these airway dimensions really should be taken with a grain of salt, the huge chunk of salt, okay? See this little thing right here, it's called threshold. Okay, airway, threshold, and this, this bar. Okay, so watch what happens if I go like that. It's thinking, it's gonna take yeah, some time thinking. to do it, yeah. So when it stops thinking, hope, I hope it's not like, complaining but because at the end of the day it's been <laughs> yeah there you go okay so the algorithm basically you're setting this to pick up voxels you pick it to pick up the units that make up this this um uh scam okay and you're setting it at a specific gray scale all right so for air air is black you know uh, but if you change the thresholding, you're gonna tell the algorithm to pick up whatever units you're asking it to, okay? So you have to be very careful, like when you're actually doing this, is that also to follow it up by going through up and down the scan to make sure that it's not picking up anything that isn't airway, right? So this one's okay, because I've, you know, that's where I said it and all that, but you know, that's the kind of thing that you need to do, all right? if you're adamant to, to do these airway dimensions. All right, but even so, look, I mean, I changed the airway dimensions. The first one was 49, now it's 52 almost. You know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can change the airway dimensions, the volume that you're, you know, you're creating, whatever is, is registering here by just by scrolling with this, you know, toggling this thing, okay? So just be careful with this. Just be careful not to call anything, you know, what it's not. 
Okay, so, but for this patient, we can see that there is this airway restriction uh, and it is narrow. There is a higher risk for sleep disordered breathing when, when we have narrower airways, you know? So just like if I were to give you three sets of straws, if I give you a smoothie straw, a regular straw and a coffee stirrer, you know, the coffee stirrers that are plastic and they have a hole in the middle, you know, which one's gonna be the easy, easiest one to breathe through? The smoothie <laughs> one, right? The bigger one, right? Yeah. Okay, but the smaller one's gonna be harder because there's gonna be a lot more resistance because the bore uh, is a lot smaller. The lumen is a lot smaller, okay? So similarly here, I mean, the smaller the airway, the higher the risk, but I've seen small airways with no sleep disorder breathing, and I've seen really large airways with sleep disorder breathing. So there's a big tone component that falls into this as well, all right? Okay, all right, so that's that. Those are like the main- Would you mind clarifying that? like what would be the exception? What would cause it to be a nice big airway and then have sleep disorder breathing symptoms? Your, mu your, mu your muscle tone and also the way your face forms. You know, you can have these large, these air large airways, but you have like basically, um, and I, I have a case in the, in the presentation, unfortunately I, I didn't pull it up here, but because of the way the, the way the face developed, because of bilateral TMJ degenerative joint disease, everything here was small. So there's not enough space for the tongue in the mouth. Now the patient, while he or she's awake, you know, they're holding everything open. But when that person sleeps, that the tongue just falls back. You know, if you've got uh, excess fat deposits, you know, um, in, in the parapharyngeal spaces, okay. Uh, in the tongue, you know, th that makes these areas flabby, all right? N not only flabby, but also it decreases the amount of space that we have in the lumen, right? Okay, um, yeah. So did, I think I answered your question. Yeah, you did. I guess, is there such thing as a normal size airway? You know, everyone wants numbers, as you know. Um, <laughs> You know, is there like a darn dentist? Yes. Darn dentist, you know, <laughs> guys, this is not a quarter millimeter chamfer. This is not like right, that. Right, okay. Right. It's not. All right. <laughs> you know, I, I know we're obsessed with numbers because we have to clear when we, we, we did cavity preps and we did like crown preps and that kind of thing. We had to have millimeter clearance and blah, blah. You know, we, we worked with millimeters, but it's not like this here. Right. You're looking for function. You're looking for morphology. Okay. And I'll show you some of the morphology that um, I noticed in this particular patient. I mentioned the jaws being small because bilateral TMJ, degenerative joint disease, or even rheumatoid arthritis, or even fractures, you know, bilateral condylar fracture, fractures will change the growth and development of the face if that happens early in life, you know? So all that, all that are things that you look for um, and you put the pieces of the puzzle together, okay? Now this patient doesn't have that small, um, small mandible and maxilla due to bilateral degenerative joint disease. There's something else going on here. So let me uh, move on to the actual airway analysis. So what I call an airway analysis is as follows. It's an anatomic evaluation of the entire upper respiratory tract from the tip of the nose down to the hyoid in addition to the, the, the form of the face. And we already showed you the form of the face, the transverse dimension of the arches. And I showed some of the tori, mm -hmm. you know, which are also a risk factor. Um, because not only are they like a sign that there's parafunction, but if you've got really big ones, that then you're cramming the space for the tongue, you know, the tongue's gonna go back. Okay, so let's take a look and see. I'm gonna start from here. I'm gonna start from the tip of the nose. Okay, so I'm coming all the way front here. And actually the first thing that I wanna look at is the, is the internal nasal valves. The external nasal valves you can see here, like if you look in the, um, like clinically, you'll be able to see in the patient, but the internal nasal valves are a little bit elusive. And you know, you'd be able to see those by creating a custom cross section as such. And then scrolling back to this area right here. So these guys right here, this slit right here and here, those are the internal nasal valves and these need to be patent. Okay. All right. So then we move on to the inside of the nose. All right. And the things that we're looking for are deviated septums, uh, spur formation, conchobulosa, 
we're looking at the transverse dimension of the, of the nose, okay, which is narrow in this case. Surprise, surprise. I mean, the maxilla is, you know, the nose is partly in the maxilla. So the maxilla is narrow. The nose is going to get narrow, okay, in many cases. So the transverse dimension of the nasal cavity is narrow in this patient. All right. So now we're going to end at the going to the end of the nasal cavity. Uh, actually, before I do that, you can see that there are all these spa these spaces. So there isn't like a, a rhinosinusitis thing going on here. You know, the sinuses are air filled. There's a drainage pathway that's patent. Okay, and I'm looking at all the sinuses. And of course, I'd have to teach you the anatomy to be able to help you figure out where everything is. But you just take my word on it. You know, this is okay sinus, this and this. A little bit of mucosal thickening right here, but the drainage pathways are good. And the passageways inside the nasal cavity are also good. All right, so there's no pathology per se in, in the nasal cavity or in the sinuses. Okay, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at all the sinuses, frontal, ethmoid, as well as the sphenoids, which are showing up right here. Okay, now I'm just showing off. You know? no, I'm glad. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's that's uh, that's it for the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses. Now we're going to leave the nasal cavity and we're going to go into the nasopharynx. So coming here into the nasopharynx on the axial view, and what I'm looking for is symmetry in the nasopharynx. It kind of looks like the Batman sign. All right. Mm -hmm. And as I travel down to the level of the heart palate, I see no asymmetry, which is a good thing because bad things can happen here. But I also look for adenoids. You know, if there are large adenoids in this area and the patient does not have anything going on in that, in this area. Okay. So on the sagittal, this right here is your nasopharynx. And there's a lot of anatomy here, which once again, I'm not going to go into, but the main thing right now, like to, to, to go through this quickly is to show that, you know, there's no large adenoids and there's no asymmetry that might be some other sinister pathology. Okay. Now let's go into the rest of the oropharynx. So starting from the level of the hard palate, we're going to go down and look for any asymmetry here. And we see that narrowing that we noticed as we scrolled through. Okay. So narrowing all the way. And we do see a little bit of a soft tissue asymmetry here, but that's because of the cervical spine being rotated. So you see how the cervical spine, like this side is a little further forward than this side. And that's basically pushing the prevertebral tissues forward. Okay. And uh, scrolling right along, uh, here we have our the tip of the uh, epiglottis. And this right here is called the vellecula. It's an air filled space. And this part of uh, of the tongue is, is actually not tongue, it's the lingual tonsils. Okay, so we're looking for soft tissue densities here that might be enlarged. Okay, so let me show you what this looks like on the sagittal and the coronal because it's a little bit easier to visualize there. Okay, so when we're scrolling on the coronal view, I'm going through the oropharynx and I'm looking for any soft tissue asymmetry or soft tissue enlargement in the area of the palate and tonsils. It's a little hard to, to see because it's, it, it's not completely uh, at, you know, along the coronal plane. So if I put these lines on, you can see that it's a little slanted. So I'm going to make it a little bit easier to look at. Okay. And as I do this, I'm going to rotate that like such okay. and come over here. And now I'm looking at the, the entire dimension like the true mediolateral dimension of the oropharynx. And I can see how these areas are bulging. Now, is that palatine tonsil or is it just fat? I don't know, okay? There's no way for you to tell what the soft tissue is here because that's cone beam CT for you. Can't characterize the soft tissues. You can only tell what the soft tissues are doing in relation to airway or bone. Otherwise you can't tell. All right, so I'm going to put this back the way it was because I'm going to do one more thing here in the sagittal. So two more things. One of them is look at how long the soft palate is. All right, so I can't do a malampati score here because that's an intraoral clinical examination, but I can measure this soft palate and I can do that with my software here. I can do like several points and then it just sums it up or you can do 
each one on, on its own at, on the curve and then just do some math. Okay, and you can see it's a very long soft palette. Okay. It's also a very thick soft palette. So there's the air line right there. So right there, there, see how it's like nine and a half millimeters and that's thick, okay? All right, um, that's the tip of the epiglottis right there. That's the molecular. We do have a little bit of lingual tonsil action going on here, but it's nothing large fungating, you know, expanding into the um, oropharynx or causing any asymmetry. Okay. So what's the story of the patient? So let's put the story together. So we, what, what the things that we've observed are with the teeth in maximum intercustation, the condyles are out of the fossa. We observed the facial development, basically the narrow transverse dimension of the, uh, of the arches, okay? Uh, also the nasal cavity. We've observed the very narrow oropharynx. We are also noticing that this narrow oropharynx is despite the fact that the head is forward. So you see how there's like a chin thing right here. I don't think I mentioned it, but there's a chin guard right here. And this thing right here is the cervical spine and it's, it's forward. There's like a little bit of forward repositioning of the head. And even with that, the airway dimensions are small. So if the patient's head posture is any different, a little bit more neutral, then the di dimensions are probably smaller in natural head posture. Okay. While we have this screen up, this screen up, what are normal soft palate numbers for length and thickness? Okay, so the, the normal uh, for an adult, I don't know what they are for kids, but for adults, it is about 38. Okay, anything longer, like 38, 39, anything longer than that is considered long. And then thickness would be eight, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12. I've seen them as thick as 13 millimeters. Okay. So um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> All right, so this patient now needs to breathe. There is an issue with this person's ability to breathe, okay? So what's this patient doing in order to, to breathe? Well, one of them may be the forward head posture if you do find that the natural head posture is actually this. Um, but another might be an advancement of the mandible, okay? Because you've got the tongue attached to the mandible, the floor of the mouth attached to the mandible. And if you move your, your mandible forward, then you're, kind of taking the tongue out of the airway, okay? So when you move your mandible forward, you're bringing your condyles into protrusive, the protrusive position. So that explains the inferior position. And with time, if that's the position you hold for a very long period of time, you're gonna have super eruption of your teeth. And the teeth are gonna meet in maximum tricuspation while the condyles are out of the fossa. And that's called dual bite formation, okay? So uh, the bruxism may be a, 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 you know, maybe due to sleep bruxism, the, an attempt to increase airway dimensions as well, right? He may be a snorer and the snoring may precipitate fibrosis, edema of, of the uh, soft palate, right? So that's the story I'm, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm right. absolutely not gonna argue with you here. <laughs> yeah. There's so much information. It's really fascinating because I have never uh, experienced something like this before. You know, I just see the, the colors and, uh, you know, green is good, yellow is warning, red is bad. So it's really nice to kind of get the, you know, this I mean, is an overview. Of course, you have four day courses explaining all of this. Yeah, right. Look, look at this. So red is bad. Let me see. There's a way to change the color. I don't, can't remember how to do it. I think it's also through this thresholding where you can actually change the, the gradation of the colors. Uh, no, it's not this. Hmm. There's a way to do it and I can't remember how to do it right now because mm -hmm. I don't real, usually play with it. But you can, you can say, I want 60 millimeters square to be purple and it's going to be purple. And I want 40 millimeters square to be blue and it'll be blue. And I want 100 millimeters square to be red. You can flip the colors. Okay. Don't, don't green me. Don't don't green red me here. <laughs> okay, you have to look at you have to look at the information. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the anatomy. Well, what is this good for, Dr. Tamimi? Because this is everyone's world is is right here for the most part. You know, just teaching generally tool. speaking. Yes, general mm -hmm. idea and teaching tool for your patient. Okay, mm -hmm. the thing is, is I've seen this uh, misused and abused. Um, in terms of 
and I also have a, this in one of my presentations where the patient was imaged prior to the procedure and then imaged after the procedure and lo and behold they saved the patient's life because they increased the airway dimensions but then when you take the two scans and you superimpose the skulls on top of each other the only thing that's changed is the neck position mm -hmm. so we would go and it's a, it it can be quite dramatic you know you can go from 70 i think what i had on my size was 70 millimeters up to 190 millimeters you know but just by moving your head forward and back so, and I see it in the literature, I see it in, in, in presentations, it's my pet peeve, you know, when I, and, and people are talking about their, their treatments, but in reality, you can see it, I can see it as a radiologist, all they did, I mean, they did something, but they also moved the head of the patient, or they changed the tongue of the position of the patient, and that also changes airway dimensions, because mm -hmm. if your tongue is to the tip of, the tip of the tongue is to the teeth, then you're moving the tongue out of the airway, but if you're just like hanging out, that's going to be a different airway dimensions situation. You know, people do the darndest things with their, their tongues. You know, they'll, they'll stick the tip of their tongue to the roof of their mouth. They'll put the whole tongue to the roof of their mouth. They'll swallow their tongues, you know? So, yeah, I mean, unless if you're going to do before and after and you want to really, you're going to de depend on these measurements, then you really need to have the patient standardized in both comparing apples to apples. And really, in the end, you're not treating this volume measurement, you're treating the patient and the improvement in the symptoms, okay? And that's what you go by as far as uh, being treated would be their reduction of symptoms? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Especially with how I see this being misinterpreted. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, you went, um, I'm so glad that we had this time to go over this, but you can see just like anything else, we had so many questions, but that's why you have a course <laughs> and right. you know, you can't really let's, I just wanted to go ahead and um, see if there are a couple of quick questions. One um, kept coming up was the hyoid bone. Can you just show that a little bit and explain how that it's, relates? to? The it's not statement? here. It's not okay. here on the field of view. It's probably like lower down, which actually means that it's a higher risk for sleep disorder breathing. So, I mean, if I had, I wish I had my anatomy slides up here, but here, your tongue, okay? So your tongue, you've got a little tubercle on, on the, the back of the inside of your tongue, that's called the genial tubercle. And you've got the genioglossus muscle and the, and the, genio, and the geniohyoid muscle, mm -hmm. okay, attaching to it. All right, so that's one connection, tongue to mandible, and then, mandible to hyoid. And then you've also had the mylohyoid muscle, which attaches to the internal oblique ridge inside your mandible, all right, down to the hyoid. So that's the floor of your mouth, both the geniohyoid and the mylohyoid muscle, okay? So if your mandible is forward, you're gonna drag those muscles forward and you're gonna take them out of your airway and you're taking the hyoid along with it because it's mm -hmm. attached to these things. And, and there's digastric as well, I forgot the di digastric. Um, so, and if you move your mandible back, you know, uh, meaning that, for example, in the case of bilateral degenerative joint disease, where there's condylar height loss and a posterior rotation of the mandible, all those structures are going to be crammed backwards, including the hyoid, which will be posteriorly and inferiorly positioned. So generally with a lower hyoid position, you have a higher risk for sleep disorder breathing. But once again, it's a finding that you need to correlate to clinical presentation. Right. Okay. Like when I write my reports, I'll, I'll just say, I'll talk about the risk factors. I'll say this, you know, the risk factors for sleep disorder breathing found on the scan are this, this, that, that, that. Please correlate to clinical presentation, you know? What does a phrenectomy do to the angulation of the hyoid bone? Well, not the angulation, but rather the, the position. Position. Because like your tongue, okay, so... It, it, what you need to do is you need to, to look into Tom Meyer's anatomy trains if you haven't already done that, okay? So he, actually, you know what? Why don't I just, I'm going to quickly just find something. That would be helpful because I know we have a lot of questions um, about what everyone just saw. So I, if you don't mind, it would be great. We may go a little over tonight just so we can answer um, some of your questions. I shall plane. Now, 
I'm not responsible for what comes out of my mouth from this point on. Okay. So <laughs> it's I'm, the just, I'm, I'm, making this, I'm making this disclaimer right now. Okay. <laughs> all right. We all heard it. So it's okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Here it is. All right. And I'm sure you guys have seen this. I mean, let me share my screen. And I just like, I, I just Googled tongue hyoid fascia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you, if you read anatomy trains, okay. So this is anatomy trains right here. And Tom Myers has a, an amazing website and he teaches all kinds of anatomy and, you know, had not had an act, but he teaches body anatomy in addition to like, they won't do the face because of, um, it's online and you know there's like the privacy mm -hmm. issues with cadavers and all that but they'll do everything else and it's just fascinating to watch just how the body is connected okay so this is like one fascial plane from the tongue and the hyoid is somewhere in here and then you've got also the lungs and the mediastinum you know and the diaphragm and all the way into your hip flexors and into your adductors and in your knee and your you know one sing single fascial plane all right uh, actually this is not what i wanted to show but this is anatomy trains right here let me see if i can pull out deep front line all right so deep front line is this right here okay and as you can see they're fascial planes they're dissectable fascial planes that run from the entire from the top that you know from the head all the way down to the toes and the tongue and the hyoid are basically along that fascial plane, all right? So if you, and that, that thickening, that frenum is, is fascia, right? And when you release that, you're releasing some of the tension on that fascia. And you need to like work with, I think also an osteopath because they also work with fascia a lot um, mm -hmm. to help retrain the body now because now you're releasing everything. You're not just releasing the tongue. You're releasing the ability to breathe, you know, the, the diaphragm and, and also the, the hip flexor muscles and whatnot. Okay. So, yeah, I hope that answered the question. It does, actually. And this will be available for replay. But what I do want to share is how you can learn more from you. Because, again, this is an overview tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and just share um, my screen. Oh, okay. Um, that's okay. Let's sure. see. You, okay. you can see my screen, I believe. So if you go to beamreaders.com forward slash courses, um, they're coming up. This is really uh, exciting. And I know that um, Dr. Knight had talked about your, this is a, um, a two-day course as well, the 20, February 26th and 27th. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the two courses? Yeah. So this is looking at the entire scan. So the stuff that I didn't do, <laughs> this would be it, you know, in addition to, of course, airway. All right. So there is a little bit of... Um, overlap between the two because I do cover the anatomy of the airway here as well as covering it here okay uh, but this one's really a deep dive into understanding the TMJ because I feel like this is like a very enigmatic part of the body that isn't very well taught in dentist, dental school and many of us go, go through our dental careers without even knowing uh, the relevance of this to our dental treatment okay so I talk about like the anatomy, I talk about the most common pathology that occurs there, which is the internal derangement and degenerative joint disease. And then what that does to the face, what that does to the symmetry of the face, to the growth of the face, and how that relates also to occlusion. Um, and then I'll, I'll cover, of course, MRI. So we're doing MRI and mm -hmm. beam CT. And then um, I do cover the airway again with with the anatomy and all that stuff so everyone i know who have taken your courses rave about them and <laughs> as one of those must see uh uh airway courses that you need to add to your list so th that's really exciting and then you have three textbooks as well you want to just go through these a little bit, a little bit? <laughs> uh, uh okay yeah. so so first edition of this one was number one and then the dental implants mm -hmm. one and then and this one and uh what can i say i mean it depends you know, what, what you're interested in. If you're into the TMJ, actually, 
Uh, the second edition of, of the, the TMJ one is, is going to be renamed to Temporomandibular Joint and Sleep Disordered Breathing. So because I, I do believe the two areas are very interrelated mm -hmm. and that we need to understand the relationship of the TMJ to the airway. Because like if we're just treating airway without thinking of TMJs or treating TMJs without thinking of airway, then we're not really doing the patient service. You know, we are diagnosing that structure but we're not diagnosing the patient you know and we do need to look at this thing a little bit more holistically you know well when will that come out the, third, the next edition oh, well it's it's still i'm still working on it so okay. it's probably, like, probably a couple of years you know okay well, we'll wait with the abated breath here uh, <laughs> just some just some quick updates um if you're curious about dr morelia's uh, mini residencies they're coming up in november and then we do have our 2022 20, uh, course schedule up on our website. So check that out to learn um, how to do expansion and interceptive orthodontics. Uh, we're thrilled to have Dr. Kevin Boyd join us. And he has two brand new courses, um, the Pediatric Validated Airway Risk Assessment. It's basically a call to action for dentists. That's December 10th. And also just enjoy treating kids in your dental practice. So Dr. Boyd goes over techniques and tactics in really caring for the pediatric airway patients and, and having fun while, while doing it. We have a myofunctional therapy course. It's a two day uh, course for the um, RDH specifically to do myofunctional therapy in the dental practice. So check out our website to learn more and I'm happy to have a call with any of you. Um, Dr. Morelli and I are going to Florida. We'll be there October 16th uh, at Clear Aligner University. So if you wanna learn more about Clear Aligner integration, especially getting your team on board, please, um, you can visit and register at clearalignru.com. We'd love to see you in sunny Florida. Um, once you take our mini residency, then we do put you on our airway dentist map. Um, and we do have a lot of uh, nice success stories coming for, for people who reach out to me from social media who are looking for an airway dentist. And um, we're actually having a lot of success stories this year. So if you wanted to be on that map, um, please consider taking our course. We have upcoming Airway Health Solutions Conversations. Dr. Kevin Boyd is October 27th and Dr. Jasmine Elmore on November 17th. And we'll keep updating these because as long as you guys keep coming, I'll keep hosting. We had um, close to 300 registrants tonight. So I really thank um, everyone for their commitment to learn more and to spend their Wednesday evenings learning more about Airway and the different um, elements of it. Dr. Swamy, I can't thank you enough. I know this is late for you and I appreciate um, you were great. You didn't, you didn't go I off. Didn't, I didn't like to go <laughs> off on it. Yeah, all right. So I didn't slur, you know. I know you were concerned. <laughs> um, but you did a wonderful job. We really appreciate it. And there's so much to learn from you. So I hope everyone takes advantage of taking your course to really incorporate this into their practice. And thanks everyone for joining. Thanks again, Dr. Dr. Tamimi. Thank Have you. a wonderful night. Thank okay. you so much. I'll talk to Thank you later. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.